factor that we could manipulate and change their behavior. Mm. And so if you stand back and say, okay, well, of, of the, the variables that I can manipulate, which ones are, are candidates? Genes, I can't manipulate. I can't manipulate gender, not in this like experimental setting. Yep. Um, I don't, you know, in the, in the toolbox of neuroscience or behavioral endocrinology, like a neuroeconomics broadly stated, you, you're not going to do, I mean, there's also, I guess you could do a trans TMS, like you could block a certain part of the brain, do like a little, you know, little subtle um, in, kind of impedance of, of the front prefrontal cortex or whatever, like from a causal, in your causal toolbox. Mm -hmm. We're thinking, well, okay, what's something that, that fluctuates a lot and seems to be deterministic or powerful or potent? Like testosterone was like the obvious answer. I mean, related to our earlier conversation about, about the winner effect, uh, the challenge hypothesis, a huge animal literature about it. Um, it just seemed like the candidate to hormone. And uh, we had done other studies at the lab before that using cortisol. We had used uh, some, actually we used one with naltrexone which uh, for those at home, that's um, for like uh, alcoholics and uh, heroin addicts to get off of it. What it does is it blocks, it blocks the, uh, the dopamine pathways in your mm -hmm. brain. And uh, we somehow got ethics approval to use that, which <laughs> I'm a bit surprised. I mean, a small proportion of people will like permanently be damaged by it. Really? Like a very small proportion. Is it similar to like methadone? I don't know how similar they are, okay. but, but I know this is like, it's just so you don't get a kick out of doing something that's bad yeah, for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, so it's probably a similar mechanism, I suppose. It's like a blocker. Yeah, blocks the neurons from, yeah. yeah, yeah. So you just don't feel good about yeah, it. It's yeah. like, you know, people suck their thumb, put the, maybe that's, this is like feel, gross. I never suck my thumb for the record, but um, I'd imagine this just it makes it not pleasurable to go have a drink or do whatever. So we had, we had like a, a bit of a precedent at the lab of doing things that were edgy or were difficult, that were hard to pass, mm -hmm. but safe. Like mm -hmm. for all intents and purposes, mm -hmm. they were safe. Um, and then Altrexone was safe. Um, so the lab I was at, I was really proud to say, it was like the like pioneering lab in, in neuroeconomics and worked with some really interesting people. So it was time for me to come up with my dissertation chapter. And as I said, testosterone seemed like the right candidate. Um, and it had, had not been done in this context, but we had the resources and had the money to do it. Um, it's pretty expensive to put this stuff off, by the way. You have to pay people really well. You know, you do the blood drugs. You got to buy the drugs. Yeah, people don't understand. <clears throat> Studies are fucking expensive. Yeah. Very expensive. Oh, yeah. The doses of drugs. It was, yeah. I mean, we bought it retail at, at a pharmacy. Yeah. Like through, through. it was, uh, and we paid people well. Between 60 and 120 bucks a person. And we'd buy the drugs, play the phlebotomy. I mean, it was, it was probably all in. It was well over 100000 maybe $200,000. Mm -hmm. If you count the man hours, it's even higher than that. Mm -hmm. We're all graduate students slaves. So it was basically free, but, um, so a lot went into it. And so what we did, we said, okay, well, let's create a stock market that is real in the sense that people are trading stocks in real time with each other. And let's see if the people that get testosterone or those markets where guys are at high levels of testosterone, will, th will those markets transact at different prices than markets where guys are trading at their normal levels. Again, double blind, randomized control trial, you don't know. So what we did, it was everybody was in the same group, got the same thing. Mm -hmm. Because it's you know, it's cleaner that way. It's really cleaner to to, to disentangle cause and effect if everybody's on the same thing. So we ran a bunch of sessions. We piloted a bunch of times, and then we. Uh, so I mean, I'll talk for a second about the, the paradigm. We're not logging people into E-Trade accounts. Like that's way too complicated. What we did was we use a paradigm. It's just called double auction markets, which was pioneered by Vernon Smith. Uh, he's he's like considered one of the major pioneers in experimental economics. Considered like the fa the, the father of experimental economics. Um, oh, Dutch he, auction? Was that Dutch? Um, he Dutch auction? No, this is like trading in real time. So, oh, okay. I mean, okay. there are Dutch auctions in experimental economics. Yeah, yeah. Like Charlie Holt, for example, works in that space. Uh, so Ver Vernon Smith, again, he's a very bright guy. He's like 90 something, really? 92, 93. The guy's amazing. Very, very sharp. Um, and he's like, he founded this field and he won the Nobel prize, huh. uh, along with the same year as Danny Kahneman and, uh, Amos Tversky, uh, who won it posthumously. They won it the same year. What's interesting. I've done, I've worked on their topics now and Vernon Smith funded the project. Huh. So it was really cool to have a Nobel laureate wow. who's like very well respected, uh, support the project and he, he gave us a good amount of money to be able to pull it good. off. Awesome. So the way he does it, he says, okay, well, instead of a real stock market, I mean, it's it's real, but in the sense of a stock, which is, there's so much stuff going on in the real world. There's, you know, the Fed could change, there's Fed, change the rate. It could be a presidential election, a bomb, 
earnings, whatever. Let's just create a, an asset that everybody knows what it's worth. And so there's no real question about the fundamental value and let people trade on maybe thoughts or emotions or whatever it is that would drive their beliefs about the mm -hmm. price. But we're all in the same session and we all know what it's worth. So at Yudwa Kinsamir, you're welcome. Here is the fundamental value chart for this trading period. And so you'll be trading with a bunch of other guys and buy and sell for whatever the hell you want. So that's the experiment. And what we found was the guys that, that came in that got testosterone, they immediately started bidding up the prices, like double, triple, quadruple the price. <laughs> And we're like, and I'm standing there. I I proctored all of the, all of them in my lab coat. I'm like, I'm like, and I can see in the side screen like what's going on. I'm like, this is crazy. Yeah. Like, and then I would would have a session. Then you know, a few a week later, we'd have a session with all, all placebo, and these guys are trading. So like the fundamental value like drops like this. So they're trying to buy below and sell above in the placebo sessions. I'm watching it real time. Yeah. I'm like, yeah. I can't believe this is happening. I was like, I'll wait till the data are all in. I don't want to like get too excited about it. But I got the data set and I was like, it's like that kind of almost fell out of my chair. Like, holy shit, this hormone actually drives these price bubbles like to the sky. Mm. And then at the very, almost at the very end of the trading sessions, because they know that it's finite, it's like 12 periods. They're like, oh crap, nobody's buying anymore. I can't resell this thing. And they would collapse, 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 all of them. So it was like this, it's like feeling like I now found a variable that can manipulate markets, at least in this, in this little sense. Yeah. It was wow. huge. It was like, it changed, it literally changed the course of my life wow. to see that you change one variable in a double blind study and you can affect a financial market. So I wonder what hedge funds are thinking like, oh shit, how do we use this? You know what's crazy? This was nuts. So we did this 2013. Yeah. Um, an article came out in the Financial Times like right around the same time showing there's a physician in New York who prescribes the exact same drug to guys on Wall Street. Really? Like Androgel. Yeah, yeah. And he says, yeah, I prescribe it. I mean, you could look it up. Um, I think Lionel Bassoon, I think is his name. I've not met him personally. I don't comment on him as a person. I, I just know he's featured in a Financial Times article. And I'm thinking, holy shit. Do you know that I just showed in a scientific way that the drug you're giving to guys who are actually moving hundreds of millions or billions of dollars, like this is what it does to them. Mm -hmm. And they don't know that. They, these guys are taking the drug off label, meaning a use other than what it was prescribed for. So that kicked up a whole bunch of attention. I had, you know, I was interviewed by like NPR and a bunch of other media outlets. Like, what the hell is going on here? So when you talk about why this matters, I didn't really complete complete my thought, but it's better to come back to it now and say it matters because the drug we use in the experiment to model changes that have happened in your body anyway are actually being used in the real environment by people who are doing the actual behavior that matters, that affects that affects the world and affects the world economy. So from we talked about cognitive reflection. I just talked about trading. There, there are other other things as well that we that we show that affects. So I was I was actually surprised pleasantly that um, it, it's actually more realistic than just like a silly lab experiment. It's like the reverse. It's like we're simulating the real world and not even knowing we're simulating the real world. I have two questions on this. Yes. Number one, we touched briefly, for example, with the example of whether it's two deers or two mooses fighting. Yeah. Winner to testosterone goes up, the loser. Well, yeah. Fuck. It is what it is. That's nature. Yeah. There's no mercy in nature. Right. Right. So genes are surviving. Mm -hmm. Humans, a little bit different, but not too different. Mm -hmm. Right. We have evolutionary biology, mm -hmm. which is dictated by our environment. And then we have evolutionary psychology. They're all together. Mm -hmm. Is there some hypothesis of why we think they would behave that way based on evolutionary and biology or psychology? Why would they start bidding, 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 bidding? Hmm. You know, like if we look at like, let's say we're a scientist of pure observation mm -hmm. and we just look at hunters and gatherers yeah, yeah. and how tribes grew up and we just sit there and just look at them. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's some type of knowledge that we can gain? Is there some comparison there? If we were to observe like free roaming people sure. versus the lab. Well, I mean, that's that's what motivated the question. It's mm -hmm. like we observe free roaming people and we don't know why the hell they do certain things. And so we take the world and simplify it and then manipulate one variable so we can make some claim about the effect of that one variable because we have too many. It becomes too ambiguous. We don't know what the hell is going on. Yeah. Uh, but this really tries to get at the questions you're asking of like evolutionarily, why would testosterone do these like these manifold things? What would affect the way you think? What would it make you more impulsive? So let's go back to the fighting thing. Yes. 
if you think about being at an elevated testosterone level and it's making you more impulsive, in some situations, that's actually a good thing. Like if you're trading in a rapid environment and you think too much, mm -hmm. you may not do as well. If you're an athlete and you're in a, imagine playing a very, a, a sport requires tremendous speed and you're, and you're thinking too much of it, like thinking of it like procedural memory, that's not gonna serve you. Um, if you're in a life-threatening situation and you need to act quickly, that may actually be the best, the best outcome, whether it's good for the other person or not. Yep. So encouraging this like rapid deployment of resources without thinking too much about it is actually an evolutionary movement towards making you more likely to survive and, and to you know, propagate it as a, as a specific genetic makeup. Um, and so what, what's really interesting, it's not just in a violent sense. It's not just in a thinking sense. Like we have another paper that you mentioned really early on was uh, on preferences for status goods. Yeah, <laughs> the bling bling. <laughs> totally. Like, I mean, this, I would admit, I thought this was a long shot. Yeah. I was like, you guys, like, I know there's a theory about it, but like, yeah. I mean, but to choose something like, like an Audi over a Ford or yeah. like a, you know, whatever. It just, I, my, my pride was like, well, we'll see. I don't care. I don't have a dog in this fight. But like the, the short answer is that we saw that people had a preference for the higher status brands. It's crazy. Like st extremely strong, robust, no matter how you slice the data, it's pretty. So pretty it was like a survey, like, sir. So before treatment, here's a survey after treatment, here's a survey. We did we did some baseline stuff before yeah. treatment. We also did validation outside of this, like a even bigger validation okay. of seeing what do people think about these brands. Gotcha. Like, okay, I think that Calvin Klein is a higher status than Levi's. They're probably very similar yeah. quality. The natural uh, perce uh, perception of that brand. Yeah. So yeah. we vetted we tested that with a totally different sample, like six hundred people. Yeah. And then we said in this experiment, how would you rate these brands? In the which uh, there's another question of um, looking at the advertisements, and we only changed so we'd have the same image, like say you know, a fancy watch, and we only changed the way that it was written. So one was drawing out the power aspect, like mm -hmm. some really powerful watch for, you know, pilots, things like that. And this other one was, uh, this is extremely high quality, well-made Swiss, mm -hmm. da, 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 da. And the other one was like, when you wear this, people know that you're the man or people know that you're high status. Mm -hmm. I say man because they're all men in the study. We can't give them the drug. And so we found that on those two those two dimensions, one is the, the ad, they, they rated the ads that was, identical visually, except for those few words about status, they they chose that as a higher one. Like that was a huge preference for that mm -hmm. particular one. And also among the brands, we'd have a continuum. We'd have on one end, the similar quality, lower status to similar quality, higher status. And we just saw that people would just choose a higher status one. Interesting. And so we, we tested it in a couple of different ways and it was like, wow. So in terms of survival, there's like a, a very deep literature in animal literature about uh, about survival, about how status signals your biological fitness. Oh yeah, and um, and so that too is based like in, in a, a famous theory. Almost, um, what's his last name? Anyway, blank out. Israeli researcher talking about how an, how animals signal this stuff, and how humans we seem to be, you know, we're in the lineage. And so this particular hormone made people more choose something that would signal to others that I am a higher status than this other person. Yeah, that's why I always like to relate things to like evolutionary biology. It's, totally, it's all in that. So we're taking an ancient hormone, yeah. taking a modern dude, tweaking just that and seeing how would you behave in a financial situation, in a thinking situation, um, in a consumer situation, just to see like, does this matter? I always tell people we're just highly more evolved chimps. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, for me, <clears throat> I've had uh, Dr. Christopher DiCarlo on here. Uh -huh. He, he talks about like free will and critical thinking. Yeah. Really cool guy. He's going to be on uh, actually this week again. And, uh, you know, we're talking about free will, how mm -hmm. free will doesn't really exist. Mm -hmm. We're more a predetermined on the evolutionary lineage that we had. Uh, obviously, it's not saying that free will is binary. It's not like y yes or no. There's a spec. There's a, there's like a bell curve, right? Mm -hmm. So you behave in a certain spectrum. It's not like. If I, if you look at the history of your life, you behave in a certain spectrum. It's not like you deviated from like one to twenty. Mm -hmm. Like there's a natural type of behavior pattern that you have. Why do you behave that way? Well, genetics plays a role. Hormones plays a role. Lineage of your ancestry plays a role. The mm -hmm. environment that you live in. Yeah, all well, this plays a role, right? And so it's it's interesting to see how like you know we're surrounded by all these environmental factors, right? Mm -hmm. You talk oh, about it, the stock market, the yeah. phone. Yeah social media, mm -hmm. but yet yeah, we're still paleolithic apes, emotionally speaking, hormonally speaking. Yeah. And it's, it's for me, it's like, you know, that's why I like, you know, 
behavioral economics is very really fascinating. It's like, and so anything that I view, it's, it's, you know, when people say like, oh, I never understood why that person behaved that way. Mm. I'm like, you're not asking the right questions. That's a wrong question. Why the person is behaving that way. The right question, what are the factors making that person behave that way? Mm -hmm. It's not about how you like that person to behave a certain way. There's a reason why that individual behaves that way. There is internal consistency to those people. Yeah. So an external observer might seem irrational or whatever. Yeah. I mean, we, we, the bottom line is we are not optimized for the world that we live in. No. Whether it's our tribe size or our, our environment we're living, you know, Toronto, most of us can afford apartments at this point, you know, and to be isolated. Maybe. You know, maybe, right? Fuck, Toronto's getting crazy, man. I know. Can I, can I slip here? Is that cool? Like, can I just move shit, into the man. studio? We're that... like a new New York coming up over here. I know, man. Shit. Yeah, I got to be a crypto billionaire to have a place. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, there's always some internal consistency with like even wild behavior. Like yeah. if you look at like, you know, whether people are having a psychotic episode, like, well, to them, that's something that's going on. I mean, we're not talking about such extreme situations. And to answer that super complicated loaded question, the way we addressed it was like, what are behaviors that we care about? So like, we're not gonna talk about, you know, um, whether somebody was rude to the waitress. We can, we'll, we'll do things that we can measure. I mean, there yeah. are people, people who probably measure that. We're saying, okay, let's take something quantifiable, such as uh, bidding for a stock or choosing a specific product or answering a question. But, but there's, sorry to inter interject, but there's that stock study is a beneficial study for hedge funds or other uh, institutions because mm -hmm. it may not be a study where they can directly apply uh, a strategy, mm -hmm. but it adds more to data points within their pre-existing strategy. Like, you know, hedge funds, they have different baskets, whether it's like, might be daily high frequency trading, might be like medium holds, long holds, different baskets, you move around the baskets, you're arbitraging. Mm -hmm. That's it at the end of the day. Making spreads, arbitraging. Okay. Then you have different other types of investors. You might be kind of like Warren Buffett investors where it's mm -hmm. like, you know, value investing, the long hold, right? Mm -hmm. uh, then you might have crazy investors. Like, let's invest in a, a startup. Uh -huh. You're a fucking lunatic. <laughs> have, that, don't you, you know, work with startups, man? Or something like that. <laughs> you know, I was like, I'm going to get my asymmetrical return, you know, <laughs> right. 100x return. Yeah. Um, the lottery ticket. Yeah, yeah pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> But the stock market's interesting because it's an amalgamation of so many psychological pressures. Mm -hmm. Testosterone, as you mentioned, plays a big role. But uh, what, lately I've been digging in a lot to René Girard, like mimetic theories. Mm -hmm. uh, and it goes to biology. Like we have something called mirror neurons. This is how babies learn very well. Like their little baby and how you express yourself. And this is how they can learn languages easy. Uh, it's monkey see, monkey do. Mm -hmm. You know, it's in us, mirror neurons. Yeah, yeah. So like mimetic theory uh, pretty much is monkey see, monkey do. The way you behave, I shall behave that way as well. Mm -hmm. And so you have the stock market and you have all these people, high testosterone, alpha. And I'm, I'm bidding, I'm bidding. And you see me, you want to outcompete me. We're two bucks. Mm -hmm. We're going at it. And so you're trying to outbid me. And But even people not at our level of like say alpha status, whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. through mimetic theory, they start behaving like us through osmosis. is isn't like I study you. I'm like, oh yeah, I'm going to do what he does. No, 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 no. This is subconscious. Mm -hmm. Just because I'm around you, I'm picking up your kind of well, we call that hurt. I mean, behavioral finance, hurt. like yeah, it's yeah. just hurting behavior. Yeah, I yeah, mean, yeah, yeah. People dismiss their own internal signal to say, well, this is doing this and this is doing that. And, it's, yeah. and nowadays people can do that in a very overt way of making people do that through tweets and through whatever. I'll give you an example in Canada. It's like, I'm not hating on anybody, but I remember in, in this is actually applies to crypto too. Uh -huh. Weed and crypto, same thing. I remember people telling me, have I invested in any weed stocks? I'm like, have you seen them? <laughs> like, have you actually done your due, due diligence <laughs> on the negative earnings? Yeah. <laughs> Or like even like the market size of Canada, like right. 35 million people out of 35 million people, how many are actually using? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's like a tiny little dinky market. Yeah. And I'm like, no, I'm not really, not really my cup of tea. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean, you know, a lot of people made a lot of money, but you can see it. Like even with crypto with the ICO boom, like everyone's just throwing money in. People asking me about tokens. I'm like, I'm like, have you done your due diligence? Like, and then people get caught up in this. Mm-hmm. 
Well, w- there's no answer. Yeah. I mean, you could have invested in an ICO early and you could be a multi, multi-millionaire right now. I mean, when you start talking about behavioral finance, like what, just like any other area of science is like you try to break it down in pieces you can understand. So yeah. herding is like a phenomenon that's measure- that's like, People do their best to measure. They both try to do both in in empirical data sets yes. and also in experiments, uh, where they say like they call it information cascades. Like for example, they'll have somebody where they have like some signal about what something's worth. So like we're talking about what wheat is worth or what crypto is worth. Well, they're given a signal and then they see other people give a signal and you see where people like dismiss their signal and go with the crowd. Like so, they're really trying to get at the mechanism of what causes this whole information cascade where they just start to dismiss what they know is true and go for, go for that. And so you talk about different investment styles. I mean, Buffett is unique in some ways and value investors, is, they're kind of like a cult. I worked with with uh, George Athanasakos at Ivy for, for a number of years on this project, looking at the different personality types that invest in certain ways. And so we're working on this for some time to see, are value investors really that different from say a day trader? And so we were, in, we're in the process of collecting data, ascertaining different personality types. If I could, I'd, I'd have a big lab and test their hormone levels. But to try to, the market is composed of all of those people. And then there's also institutional factors. Mm-hmm. A day trader, nothing's constraining you from buying or selling your amount of money. But institutions like mutual funds or say, you know, hedge funds or, or p- pension funds, they move at a, like this glacial pace yes. in massive quantities. Yes. And and when you're trying to follow what people are doing, like it's it's very very difficult. I mean, it's mind boggling. So. What I find when you're trying to really study something that it's a bit maybe unsatisfying at the end because by trying to understand something, you must isolate to to have any firm statement about it. And by doing so, you have had to sort of blind yourself to the rest of the complexity of it, just like the matrix. Like where if you see the whole thing, you know, in the movie, they say, well, you just want to understand. You have to see it encoded. 